Twitch, uh, welcome. Uh, we've got a great uh, special little uh, stream here uh, that's about a major astronomical discovery that is going to be announced uh, very shortly within the next few seconds that I wanted to stream to you live because I think it's interesting. It's something that's getting a lot of buzz in uh, around on the internet right now, and it's something that uh, um, is really a lot of chatter in uh, among space journalists. And I think by with the public, it's going to capture a lot of people's imagination. Uh, it's an advancement in our understanding of their universe uh, as we un as we know it. And it's something that's, I think, very cool. And being able to uh, live stream uh, the actual uh, explainer, the news explainer that the researchers that made this discovery announcement, um, I think it's going to be interesting to see. So I wanted to share this with you. I'm interested. I'm excited to find out what this is about. Uh, I do have a little bit of a heads up on it. I've been looking at uh, stuff uh, regarding it, so I know what's going on. But my lips are sealed as a space journalist. I can't say much, but we're going to be tuning into what's uh, the news conference that they're going to be showing. I'm going to share uh, my feed have, and let's see what they have to say, these researchers. Let's see if uh, we can get online here. There we go. At the East Asian Observatory, Cambridge, Imperial College, the Open University, Royal Observatory Greenwich, Atacama Large Millimeter, Submillimeter Array, and Kyoto Sangyo University. Jane and the other panelists will give short presentations on their new work. There will then be plenty of time for questions directed by my colleague, Dr. Robert Massey, from journalists in this Zoom room. I'm proud to say that Jane, who will start in a second, is also a former RAS Research Fellow. Over to you, Jane. Thank you, Phil, for that nice introduction. Okay, um, let me just try and share my screen here. Yep, that looks good. Okay, so hello, Borida. Thank you for coming along to our press briefing. So myself and William Ansara will speak to introduce the work. Uh, as Phil mentioned, Anita is also online for some technical questions. The four of us are representing our team that's having a paper published, in fact, right this moment, online by the journal Nature Astronomy. The journal have very kindly agreed to make that free to access for anyone who's watching or indeed anyone in the world today. So what have we done? We're here to tell you we have detected a rare gas called phosphine in the atmosphere of our neighbor planet, Venus. And the reason for our excitement is that phosphine gas on Earth is made by microorganisms that live in oxygen-free environments. And so there is a chance that we have detected some kind of living organisms in the clouds of Venus. Seems like there is a slowdown here. Hmm, let's see. So yeah, I really am talking about Venus. As you probably know, the surface conditions there today are really hostile. The temperature is enough to melt our landers, for example. Um, but it's thought that much earlier in Venus history, the surface was much cooler and wetter and life could possibly have originated. Um, but conditions turn very hostile, and as my colleague Sarah will mention a bit later on, there is a long-standing theory that some of the smallest forms of life, these microorganisms, might have been able to evolve upwards into the high clouds. So conditions there are certainly not nice. They're extremely acidic, and it's very windy. Um, but on the other hand, if you're talking about 50 to 60 kilometers up, um, then the pressure is much like it is at the surface of the earth and the temperature is quite nice maybe up to about 30 centigrade or 85 degrees fahrenheit so it's been hypothesized that this is a living habitat today so i originated a project in 2016 to see if we could look deliberately look for phosphine as a possible signature of living organisms in the high clouds of venus Okay, so we started with the James Clark Maxwell Telescope in Hawaii, which is operated by the East Asia Observatory, and the UK is a long-term member of the other partners there. 
We also then went on to use the ALMA network of telescopes down in Chile. That's operated by Europe, North America, Japan, and other partners. And I should mention, if you've got technical questions about our observations, I'm the expert on JCMT data, and Anita Richards is on an audio link to answer everything about ALMA. Okay. So what were we looking for? So Venus is a natural source of radio waves. Um, so the wavelengths we were looking at are approximately one millimeter and the radio waves originate kind of in the middle cloud layer. So if you've got a phosphine molecule above that, it can absorb that radio light and take some of it away. And that actually happens at a really specific wavelength, which is to do with the um, essentially the quantum rotation of the molecule. So they like to take that um, particular wavelength of radio light and remove it from the spectrum of Venus. So what we get is not uh, an image as you might like or hope, <laughs> we just get a graph. So if there was no phosphine there, but you spread the radio light out by wavelength, you'd get a flat red line here. Um, but if you've got the phosphine present as its very specific wavelength, which is 1.123 millimeters, the phosphine molecules will have removed the radio light and so you'll see a dip, the signal strength will go down at exactly that point. And so our colleague Hideo Sagawa, um, whom from Kyoto Sangyo University in Japan, has done the calculations which tell us for a certain number of phosphine molecules how deep this dip will be. Okay, so to cut to the chase, we have detected the phosphine and this is the data from the telescopes. So you don't see a smooth curve like in that simulation because the data come off the telescopes digitized. So you see this kind of step graph here. But the first one we got is the discovery spectrum from the James Clark Maxwell Telescope in 2017. You can see this dip in the middle. And then we were able to turn the full power of the many ALMA telescopes onto this in 2019, two years later. And we got a more detailed view of the planet's spectrum. And then you can also, again, see we have recovered this V-shaped dip at the right wavelength. So given we did this with two completely independent observatories, what we can say is with very high confidence, we have detected the phosphine on Venus. And this is very exciting and was really quite unexpected. What else can we say from the data? I can tell you from the height at which the radio waves originate, the phosphine molecules must be in that temperate zone or possibly a little bit above it. This is something we're trying to refine. In the more detailed view of the planet's atmosphere that ALMA gave us, it was able to separate different latitudes on the planet, and that told us something very interesting. So there's a long-standing idea that if there's a habitat for living microbes today, they would probably circulate in these global circulation patterns, and in particular the Hadley cells. So they might be drifting along towards the poles and then sink before they get to the pole and come back to lower layer, and maybe they'll be most active when they're in sunlight. So these Hadley cells, north and south on the planet, were thought to be a good place to look for signs of life. And what we saw is in fact where you wouldn't expect the molecules because the bacteria or microorganisms are not there. If you combine the signals from the north and south poles, we do indeed get this flat gray line. There's no phosphine there. If we combine the signals from the north and south Hadley cells, we get this very distinct in blue v-shaped dip that shows us the phosphine is strongly absorbing. So that's really encouraging. Um, what else can I tell you? Um, so from Hideo's model, we can show that the phosphine is there, but it's very scarce. So it's about 20 molecules for every billion other molecules, approximately. And what does that tell us? Well, my colleague Paul Rimmer at Cambridge University in the UK then used his atmospheric models, and he tried what would happen if you put a source of phosphine in this computer simulated atmosphere and let the um, chemistry of Venus work away at it. And he found that the original idea was probably not crazy. So um, the organisms wouldn't actually need to be super efficient. They could be producing phosphine at about 10% of the peak efficiency we see off of real organisms known on Earth, and that would make the 20 parts per billion we see. So to me, this is really encouraging um, for the hypothesis of life, but of course we've been really careful and we thought about it and we thought, well, maybe there's some other easy way to make phosphine on Venus. And that's what my colleague William is going to tell you uh, next. So I'll pass over control to him.
Okay, thanks very much, Jane. Um, so as, as Jane said, uh, Paul's model showed that uh, phosphine was broken down at a, a known rate in the Venus's atmosphere and hence had to be produced at some rate to counterbalance that breakdown. And so we spent a couple of years trying to work out what chemical processes might produce phosphine at that rate. And to do this, we had to build a network of chemical reactions that could happen in the atmosphere, um, such as down the left-hand side of the screen here, and then predict what the rates through that network would be under Venus conditions. Um, and so this is, uh, this is a, a model of the um, uh, uh, a cartoon of Venus's atmosphere altitude down the um, left-hand side and temperature and pressure up the right-hand side. And what we're trying to uh, do here is to model the chemistry in those different layers of the atmosphere. And we've used three different approaches to do the chemical process as UV from the sun hits the atmosphere. Just a quick... Uh update for those of you joining us right now we're watching a presentation by the royal astronomical society in the uk about a major announcement of potentially finding biosignatures uh, basically potential signs of possible life uh, in the atmosphere of venus the planet venus so this is a pretty big thing finding phosphine and these are the researchers right now that are talking about that finding of this molecule, this phosphorus-based molecule, and how, uh, what it may mean in using their computer models and their telescope observations of what the meaning of finding this, this chemical, uh, this molecule on, uh, in the atmosphere of Venus. So let's, uh, let's return. The way you do that is you say, what is the energy of the molecules involved? And does a reaction release energy rather than consume energy? as it progresses. This is the science of thermodynamics. And so we did thermodynamics calculations on the reaction of all the known or postulated components of Venus atmosphere with each other, um, with cloud droplets, with haze particles, with dust from the surface, uh, over 70 reactions in all, and asked would those reactions produce the 20 parts per billion phosphine? And again, the answer was no. And not just maybe no, but it was no to within many orders of magnitude, many factors of 10. The third component is could reactions in the rocks under the surface produce phosphine and outgas that, erupt that gas into the atmosphere. Uh, and again, rock calculations using thermodynamics suggested that yes, volcanoes could produce tiny, tiny traces of phosphine. Uh, but it will be parts per quadrillion in the atmosphere, not 20 parts per billion. So, um, so that was the, 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 the sort of obvious chemistry. Um, and then we looked at some less obvious uh, potential sources of phosphine and things like lightning um, or meteorites. Could meteorites deliver some mineral to the surface that would then break down to form phosphine? And again, the results of all those calculations were that those sources would fall short by factors of millions or more of the rate needed to explain the observation we've got. So that really left us with, with two possibilities. Um, the first is that there's some completely unknown, exotic, and uh, therefore very exciting chemistry going on in the clouds of Venus that nobody has speculated on before. Or, and this is the, the more exciting one, that the phosphine was being produced by life. We did some initial calculations on the possibility it's produced by life based on the idea that the microorganisms might use chemicals similar to the ones that are in the biochemistry of Earth. So in microorganisms, in plants, in you and me. Would those chemicals be able to drive the production of phosphine under Venus conditions? And the tentative initial answer is yes, they could. So that's encouraging. The problem is that, as Jane said, the clouds of Venus are incredibly harsh. They are made up of 80% plus sulfuric acid, and that is an incredibly potent dehydrating agent. It's very corrosive. I mean, just an example, they've got a couple of snapshots of what happens if you add concentrated sulfuric acid to sugar. You know, why 
cream sugar. Um, and within a minute, it turns it from white sugar into this steaming column of acid charcoal. And we expect it to do the same with life forms in Venus. So it's really hard to understand how life could exist in that environment. So we've got an amazingly exciting discovery and we've got a number of really speculative but really exciting possibilities for explaining it. Um, in that is like so many really exciting advances in science, uh, we don't quite know and we really want to find out. Um, I really want to hand over to Sarah Seeger at this point to put this in the context of the exciting search for life on other worlds uh, in our solar system and elsewhere. Again, we're watching a discovery of phosphine, a Hello. potential biosignature of so life on Venus. Are uh, the discoverers are announcing their discovery right As now. So Jane let's tune William in again. Summarized, we are claiming a confident detection of phosphine gas whose existence is a mystery. And I just want to reiterate what William said that phosphine can be produced by some processes on Venus, but only in such incredibly tiny amounts. It's not enough to explain our observation. So we're left with this other exciting, enticing possibility that perhaps there is some kind of life in Venus's clouds. So on Earth, phosphine is only associated with life, either bacteria and oxygen-free environments or as produced by humans. So you should know that phosphine exists in Jupiter's and Saturn's atmosphere because those atmospheres are dominated by hydrogen gas and also importantly, have the right temperatures and pressures lower down to create phosphine. We have to continue. Uh, we'd like to see our phosphine measurement confirmed at other wavelengths. Some team members have or are proposing to observe phosphine in the infrared with ground-based observatories, though that will be challenging because of the weak spectral features at phosphine in the infrared. We hope our work will motivate space missions that go to Venus and directly measure gases in the atmosphere. People have speculated on life in the Venus atmosphere for decades, for over 50 years actually, starting with Carl Sagan. And perhaps life originated when Venus was cooler with liquid water oceans. But as Venus heated up and underwent its catastrophic runaway greenhouse, the oceans evaporated and the surface became so hot that any life would have been killed. But life in the clouds, assuming life had been able to migrate to the clouds and live there, that life would have survived. Now, by the way, Earth has life in the clouds. Bacteria are upswept from the surface and they live freely floating in the clouds or in liquid water droplets. And life stays up there only for about a week or so. Sometimes it's transported across continents before being rained back down. Now, Earth's clouds don't last very long. But on Venus, the clouds are permanent. They cover the entire planet and they are very big uh, in vertical extent. But as William mentioned, Venus's atmosphere is incredibly harsh, so there's no real analogy with Earth's, Earth. Our team has taken uh, the ideas of life in the clouds of Venus and tried to quantify it one step further. Here you're seeing the same cartoon figure of Venus's atmosphere that William showed. And you're seeing the dashed lines demarcate the so-called temperate zone, where our phosphine observations are coming from and where the temperature is not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. The circle with the arrows depicts the life cycle hypothesis that we came up with. We argue that any life on Venus, like bacteria type particles, would have to reside inside the protective hydrosulfuric acid, even though the acid itself is incredibly harsh. Now, the life would live inside these droplets, metabolizing and reproducing, but the droplets collide. And over time of months or a year or so, the droplets would get big enough and heavy so that they would, by gravity, fall or rain out of the atmosphere. But unlike here on Earth, where the rain hits the surface of the planet, the, the sulfuric acid rain droplets would evaporate, leaving a dried out hypothetical spore. That being light enough now 
would not fall out any further. And this haze, we, we hypothesized this uh, spore, these spores could populate a lower haze layer right beneath the Venus clouds. Now this lower haze layer is mysterious. People don't have much understanding of it, but it is long lived and very stable. After some time, this life cycle hypothesis continues that after days or months or years, for some of the spores, they will eventually be updrafted where they will absorb back in the temperate zone, absorb liquid, become hydrated, and the life cycle will continue. Human, as humans, we have wondered about life beyond Earth for thousands of years. We now know that nearly all stars have planets and astronomers have found thousands of exoplanets orbiting nearby stars. We know that rocky planets are common. A generation of astronomers is now working to enable future telescopes, observations and theory to be able to find signs of life on exoplanets far away by looking for gases in the atmosphere that don't belong. Our team has also studied phosphine gas. Though it's very different than the Venus case because we would need a lot of observation time or a lot more phosphine or both. In our solar system, you know, closer to home in our solar system, there are a growing number of bodies of astrobiological interest for the search for life. We have NASA's Perseverance rover on its way to Mars to search for signs of ancient life. Jupiter's icy moon Europa is one of our best targets because of its liquid water oceans beneath its icy shell. Saturn's moon Enceladus, like Europa, has water geysers that people imagine sending a spacecraft to to fly through and look for organics. Saturn's moon Titan is actually even more interesting with liquid. Liquid is needed for all life as we know it. But Titan has liquid hydrocarbon lakes of ethane and methane. Now we have, by our phosphine gas discovery, we have raised Venus higher up on that ladder of interesting targets. And we hope that our discovery motivates focused space missions to go to Venus, to look for other gases, more gases, signs of life, and even life itself. Now I'll turn you back to our moderator. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and I believe I'm live now, which is great. So uh, I'm Robert Massey. I'm the Deputy Director of the Royal Astronomical Society, and I'll be uh, moderating the Q&A session that's following now. I should mention this is a media briefing, so we're prioritizing questions from journalists uh, in this context. But if you're watching on YouTube, you might want to be aware that there's a Twitter Q&A session tomorrow. If you follow at Royal Astrosoc on Twitter, you'll see full details of that and also that we're doing a Reddit Ask Me Anything the following day. So there are going to be plenty of opportunities to uh, find out more about this over the coming days. Now, I'm going to operate a system where I look at the participant list and I ask you to raise your hand digitally. And I will look for that. So bear with me. And I will then uh, get my colleague Lucinda to bring you in um, and give you audio and video for the time that you ask your question. So what I would ask is in a regular press conference, if we were all in the same room, is if you could say who you are and uh, where you're from. And if obviously, if you have a question for the panel as a whole, say so. And if it's directed to a particular panelist, then say that too. Um, so I can see uh, four hands up already. I'm going to start with uh, Chris Lintot. So Chris, uh, what's your question? Hello, all. Congratulations on a fascinating result. I want to note before I say anything else that the paper isn't currently open access, and I hope that you'll post it somewhere soon so that people can, can read it. Um, my question is to you, William. I think um, the importance of this result rests on the um, chemical modeling that you've done. Um, could you say more about how you get to this result that um, the amount of phosphine that could be produced by known chemical processes is so low. Um, give us some examples of the detail into which you've gone to, to establish that result. Yeah, um, uh, only briefly as we uh, I don't have the rest of the day for the press conference, but, but yes. Um, so to uh, so take, take an example, um, if, if you want to make phosphine in the lab, 
uh, what you do is you take a molecule, a substance called phosphorous acid and heat it up and, and you get phosphine. Um, so the, the question is, um, could, you, could that be happening in the clouds of Venus? And so what you, what you can do is work out for the clouds of Venus, for the different gases in there, what would the reaction be to turn phosphoric acid, which is the form we think is present in the clouds, which is the most stable form of phosphorus, into phosphorous acid um, at a high, high altitude where it will be stable, and then it would fall to a lower altitude um, where it's where it'd be less stable and will break down. Um, and you do those calculations thermodynamically. So you know the energy of phosphorous acid, phosphoric acid, the gases you would have to react to make those, those reactions happen and so on. Um, and you work out therefore how much phosphorous acid there is. And that comes out about um, 44 milligrams or about weight of three grains of rice um, for the whole of Venus. Okay, this is not per drop, this is across the entire planet. And so you could say, well, that's you know far, far less than the amount you need to explain um, the phosphine. Uh, it's, it's those sort of calculations. Then you have to go through that for every, all the possible combinations of reactions and combinations of materials that, that you can think of. It's, it's, it's quite an exhausting process. And I must confess, it gets at times a bit tedious because one's chemical intuition says, yeah, of course, but, but you have to prove it, don't you? Okay, in case you're wondering, you know, the shuffling between Jane and myself is because we're in the, we're the same room obeying the rules on social distancing. So uh, I can see uh, plenty more questions coming in now. So the next one I'm going to take is from uh, Hobart Schilling. And Hobart, when you come in again, if you could say, uh, you know, who you're writing for or, or reporting for. And obviously then if you have a person you want to direct the question to. You may need to unmute yourself. I think Lucinda will give you the uh, authorization to do that or switch on your video if you choose. Is this okay? Yes, we can hear you. That's great. Go okay. ahead. Uh, I'm Hover Schilling. I'm a freelance astronomy writer in the Netherlands. My question is for Sarah. Um, about a year ago, you co-authored this paper on phosphine as a significant biomarker. I have actually two questions. The first one is, when you wrote that paper, were you already aware of these Venus observations? And my second question is, uh, are we able at all to make similar detections on uh, Earth-like extrasolar planets? Sure, well, I'm glad you asked that question because our story is a fascinating, unique story in science. Professor Jane Greaves was working on phosphine completely independently to my team. Dr. William Baines, he was interested in phosphine on his own since the 1990s. We wrote a series of three papers, including the one you mentioned. And as word got around about our papers, a mutual contact linked us with Jane's team. Now, most of you hadn't heard of phosphine. It's so obscure. No one cares about it except for a few very niche people. And both Professor Jane Greaves and William and Janusz Bukowski and my team, we came across the same obscure papers talking about how phosphine is associated with life. So we got put together in this sort of really happy connection. And no, it actually wasn't related. We had started our phosphine as a biosignature gas in 2015. And as Jane mentioned, she started her work in 2016. So Jane and I did know each other from like, I don't know, the beginnings of exoplanets, but we never would have crossed paths because our work was so different. Now about your question as phosphine as a biosignature gas. So my team is going through like every gas that could be potentially a biosignature gas on exoplanets, but they're all turning out to be incredibly challenging. Our paper, as if you read it, it says the one on phosphine for exoplanets, it could take many, many hours, tens or even a hundred hours of the James Webb Space Telescope time. And it's quite a weak feature unless life figures out a way to re-engineer the atmosphere with phosphine gas. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next one I'm going to take is from uh, Kimberly Cartier. So again, uh, Kimberly, if you can uh, introduce yourself and uh, direct a question to one of the panelists, or, or all of them, if you prefer. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we're hearing you well. Great, thank you so much for taking my question and such a fascinating discovery. Um, uh, my question is about how long phosphine lasts in Venus's atmosphere at the at this particular cloud level. Do we have any idea of that? And from that, can we tell 
whether the phosphine is produced all the time or if it's more sporadic. That'll be William. Um, yeah, really good question. Um, the lifetime is not that well constrained. It depends on the uh, concentration of the uh, uh, reactive radicals generated by photochemistry. And that itself depends on some details of the Venusian atmosphere that are not that well known. We are talking about um, sort of in, in near the top of the clouds, sort of um, thousands of seconds, that sort of range. Um, going down deeper underneath the clouds, very much longer than that. And how much longer is, is very poorly constrained. Um, so uh, the, so how is, is it likely to be produced so periodically? It could be, um, but it's not, it, it's not sort of going to be produced in short bursts and then hang around for a long time. Um, it could be produced, you know, on a sort of hourly cycle or something. Uh, but um, beyond that, it's really hard to say. I think something I'd add to that is the super rotation of the atmosphere. Um, so gas particle being carried around completely the planet in about four Earth days. So some of the signatures we're looking for, even if they're produced by a little colony of microbes or some local source, they might get very smeared out very quickly. Next thing. Okay, the next one we have is from uh, Matt Kaplan. And again, Matt, if you can introduce yourself, we'll bring you in. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, this is Matt Kaplan. I'm the host of Planetary Radio for the Planetary Society. Congratulations on, uh, first of all, these, this marvelous discovery. Uh, this question is really for any of you or all of you. Um, you talked about how you hope that this result will increase the interest in uh, returning a mission to Venus. What sort of mission would you like to see that would be best capable of investigating further this layer of the atmosphere where uh, this activity may be taking place. So Jane, do you want to take that as the lead off? I think I might direct that to Sarah, if that's okay with you, Sarah. Well, as you may know, there has been a lot of mission planning and mission thinking for many years, actually. And right now there are two missions under the NASA Discovery class. They're under a phase A competition right now. So we'd like to see really any, ki any kind of mission go back to Venus something that's capable of measuring gases in the atmosphere, something that has a so-called mass spectrometer that can identify like larger complex molecules that could only be associated with life. We, uh, we have a long list of things we'd like actually. Perhaps ultimately we could send a microscope. This is tougher actually because cells uh, are spherical and or they may be confounded with hazes and other aerosols and atmospheric particles. So it's like the missions that are being planned but focused on signs of life detection and life detection itself. Just to add to that, I think it is very exciting. Japan have got an orbiter at the moment. India have plans to launch one. Um, Europe has longer term plans. We're really hoping somebody or maybe, you know, private space industry, somebody might take this up. Would you like to see a balloon as has been proposed in the past that might actually reach into this layer of the atmosphere? A balloon is certainly the best way in the Vega balloons did just that. They were, they lasted a couple days. They were, you know, tens of kilograms, low tens of kilograms. And that's the kind of thing we'd like to see happen again. Perhaps a super version of those that instead of lasting two days could last weeks, months, even a couple of years. Thank you. Right, I can see a huge number of questions coming through, which is no great surprise. So uh, the next one I'm gonna take is from uh, Clive Cookson, if that's okay. So Clive, if you're there, or get ready to switch on your mic. Great, thanks very much indeed. I'm Clive Cookson, the Financial Times science editor. I was wondering, this is probably for William, whether you've done any calculations to show how abundant the microbes would be if they exist to produce um, phosphine at the rate required, given how long it lasts or doesn't last its destruction rate, it's abundance, the, the abundance of the, um, of the gas. If I could How... slightly jump in, um, 
So the ten percent I mentioned is um, they could either be all over, all through the clouds, um, but working at about ten percent of um, peak Earth productivity, or they could perhaps occupy ten percent of the volume of the clouds, but be um, the really peak producers. But I think William has got a more um, concrete answer to that. Uh, yeah, thank. Well, not really, Jane. Um, <laughs> the the ten percent assumes that the organisms are producing. Uh, phosphine at the same sort of rate as they do in some specific ecologies on Earth, um, which are anaerobic, so there are no um, atmospheric oxygen in them, and are fairly phosphorus rich, so there are a lot of phosphate uh, mineral in them. Um, but that is specific to Earth metabolism. So if the same metabolism is happening at the same rates in Venus, then yeah, you're talking about. Um, you know, sort of 10% of the clouds or something. Whether that means 10% by volume or by area is not entirely clear yet. And that has the huge assumption that the Venusian microbes, if they exist at all, have metabolisms um, similar to Earth's. And the one thing we know about them is that they probably don't. So it's, I, it's I really like hard to say. I just like to say, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. What's embedded in William's comments from this and a prior question is that there's a lot about the atmosphere we don't know. You know, we'd like to measure every gas and the radicals, the, the gases that destroy phosphine. We don't know those in detail as a function of altitude. And so it's hard to sort of run through all the exact numbers for a hypothetical life form. We have no idea if it's there or how it works. And it's really um, uh, made harder because we don't know enough about the chemical con exact chemical constituents of the atmosphere. We're hoping to measure the distribution of phosphine um, in sort of area across the planet and depth into the atmosphere um, as soon as ALMA comes online again. But of course, um, we need to respect the need of the telescope staff to stay safe in the pandemic. So, um, you know, stay tuned for that one. Okay, I can see that you can't be quantitative, but qualitatively, surely there must be quite a lot of these microbes to produce the signal that you've observed, mustn't there? I mean, they couldn't be very rare well, organisms. It, it, I guess that's a question. It's unlikely to be. It's it, the organisms are in the colonies on um, Earth, which is not a question I know the answer to. So, William. Um, yeah, it's it's not really a question that even people on Earth have an accurate answer to for um, for environments on Earth, uh, where you can actually go there and take up you know buckets of, of stagnant swamp and look at the microbes in them. And people still can't say precisely which microbes are making phosphine and which are, um, um, and uh, in detail how they do it. So there are a huge number of unknowns here. Um, yes, th this is not going to be you know one tiny patch a few meters across somewhere drifting in the cloud producing phosphine. Um, it's it's going to it's going to be fairly widespread in the sense it will be spread across the planet. But whether it is. Um, spread across in, in one narrow band of latitude or quite widely in latitude, uh, in altitude, uh, we really have no way of even guessing at the moment. And, and this is why having more data on the distribution of, of gases and phosphine is so important. Journalists love to push us to speculate, but it's not really something we can do right now. Yeah, I'll pass you back for the next question, I think. Okay. Thanks, Jane. I'm going to try and do it out of shock so with a, a different laptop. So, Sorry, we're dancing around the uh, precautions here. Exactly, yeah. This, this, this is life in the pandemic. So I can see, I think, a number of questions coming here. I'll take one from Ethan Siegel. If you're, if you're there, I can see your hands raised, uh, and we'll bring you in now. Hi, this is Ethan Siegel. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Go ahead, Ethan. yourself uh, hang on am i am i still unmuted okay you're, you're fine now we can hear you all right thank you thank you thank you for having me on thank you for taking my question um one of the things uh sarah you brought it up and i think william you might uh know a little more about it but anyone can answer this um one of the things that I like to think about when it comes to this is, okay, uh, alien life would be like really a fantastic explanation for this, but 
boy, you really have to rule out all the mundane ones first. And I was going to ask you a question about Jupiter and Saturn. We see large amounts of phosphine in interesting ways on Jupiter and Saturn, right? We see that it's abundant. It's We think it's produced in the high pressure environments uh, with hydrogen at high densities that we don't achieve on other planets. Um, we see the density is dependent on latitude, temperature conditions, solar radiation received. Um, Venus, of all the non-gas giant planets, has the most gas giant-like atmosphere in a lot of ways. Um, can we really be confident, because I, I have, I'm not an expert on this, um, can we really be confident that there isn't some atmospheric process that is producing this phosphine completely abiotically? Um, are we really confident in how these gases and how phosphine is produced on Jupiter and Saturn? And we can absolutely rule out that it's not happening the same way on Venus. Can, can you speak to that, please? Yeah, I'll speak briefly first, then turn it over to William. So first of all, we are extremely confident that phosphine is not produced on Venus. It is still not comparable to Jupiter and Saturn in terms of temperature, pressure, and hydrogen. You know, we have this 100 page paper we're posting that will show you all possibilities. However, you're right, never say never. There could always be something we overlook. So I want to kind of go back to science. You know, we're putting this result out there, we're expecting it to generate more work, but ultimately, the only thing that will answer this question for us is there life, is there not life, is actually going to Venus and making more detailed measurements for signs of life and maybe life itself. William? Yeah, that's that's exactly right, Sarah. Uh, I, I'm, and and your question is entirely entirely correct. You know, in order to make this quite extraordinary claim that there might be life there, we really have to rule everything out. And that's why we're very cautious to say we are not claiming there's life. We're claiming there's something that is really unknown, and it might be life. Um, as to Jupiter, we are we are in versus Venus, and uh, we are we are very confident that the Jupiter process is not happening on Venus. In order for that chemistry to happen, you'd have to have um, thousands of atmospheres pressure of hydrogen gas. And there is uh, almost no hydrogen atoms, never mind hydrogen gas, in the atmosphere of Venus and, and by inference below the surface. So that particular chemistry is definitely not happening on Venus. Is there some unknown chemistry that's happening there producing phosphine? Well, by definition, if it's unknown, we don't know. And I, 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 I'd love to be able to say I have rigorously, you know, we, the team, have rigorously ruled out every possible form of chemistry. Uh, we've only ruled out what we, as a team, and all the referees that have reviewed the papers and several other people we've talked to have thought about or speculated about. There might be something we don't know, and that's why going there and looking for it is so important. But just to wrap that up, we know there isn't abundant hydrogen in the upper atmosphere of Venus because the other chemistry would also be completely different from what we expected. And JCMT and ALMA have been doing this for years and decades, so we would know. Okay, I think uh, Robert right. can okay. take another question. All right, I'll take uh, one now. I think I've got a Nikolai Guaroni. I think you, I'm going to be registering for the briefing earlier on today. So Nikolai will bring you in now. And again, if you could say where you're from, if you, who you're writing for, or which agency or, or outlet, that would be great. Hello, uh, I'm a science reporter for the BBC Russian service, and as a science reporter for the BBC Russian service, first of all, congratulations on your discovery. Uh, the, the observations made on Venus were mostly made, as um, Presswell has mentioned, with um, Vega, the Soviet um, orbiter and the sort of lander, and you, you mentioned the balloons. Now, Russia is preparing another mission to Venus, which is called Venera D. Uh, have you been in touch with them, and will those discoveries be somehow proved by that mission? We would love to be in touch with them. Haven't so far, because this has all happened in a big rush. We were um, doing all the calculations um, for the paper. Um, but if someone can put us in touch, that would be fantastic. You know, and I, I do appreciate the the enormous technical effort that went into getting the Vega 2 lander down through a long voyage through the clouds onto the surface in 1985. Um, our only independent measurement of um, basically essential raw phosphorus in the atmosphere comes from that lander. So it would be great to connect with that historic effort as well. 
So as a follow-up, uh, have you discussed any orbiters or landers uh, on Venus with, uh, with these new discoveries? It's been too soon for me, certainly. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, I can go to, I'm uh, looking at people who've been waiting a while, so can we go to uh, Rick Lovett? Thanks. Am I there? Yeah. Hello? All right. Okay. Thank you. Rick Lovett. I'm freelance, uh, writing uh, for Cosmos Magazine in Australia. Some of what I wanted to ask has been answered, uh, sort of. I'm interested in what we know of the earthly organisms and the type of biochemistry that produces this. Um, not so much because it's because uh, it might exist, be duplicated on Venus, but just who, what are they? That's probably Sarah, right? <laughs> well, I can start. I mean, right now, it's a good question, actually, because we don't know exactly which life form on Earth produces phosphine. You know, there's, in, I personally am 100% convinced that life on Earth produces it, as are many, many people. But it looks like it's some kind of strain of E. coli, but we don't know. And the biologists also don't know the exact biochemical pathway that makes phosphine. We hope that our work is going to motivate pushing that research along. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I, I could see there was a hand going up and down. It might be a connection issue for Pamela Gay. So if you're, if you're there and want to ask a question, we'll just raise your hand and we'll bring you in. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to go to... Oh, her hand oh, there is she up. Is. Go, yeah. go, come on then, Pamela, let's bring you in. I know you've been there coming off for a while. And you should be able to speak now. Are you there, Pamela? Okay, well, we, we can try and come back to you if you're, if you're not uh, coming in, so I'll, I'll bear you in mind. Um, okay, so I'm going to go to uh, Christian Reddy, I think, next. Christian. No? You should be able to speak now, uh, Christian. We're not hearing you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah. Yeah. Go okay. ahead. If you Thank could you speak much. really loudly, I'm struggling a bit with electricity here. Of course, of course. Well, first of all, congratulations on an amazing uh, and, and uh, provocative result. Um, yeah. What I'd like to ask is, uh, I think uh, Sarah uh, was talking about this earlier, about other ways of confirming this. So you've already had the discovery signal. You've had confirmation from ALMA. What additional confirmations or potential biomarkers would you hope to see uh, detected, uh, short of, of course, descending into the clouds and picking up a, you know, a Venusian fly or something like that? What, what else would you hope to uh, detect? Who would like to take that? Uh, Sarah, I think, perhaps? Well, we haven't given really that too much thought right now. As Jane said, we've been so busy just getting this, this result done. I think it's tough to, I mean, it's a good question for Jane to answer of what can we observe at radio wavelengths. A lot of these molecules- uh, um, Sorry, Sarah, carry on. <laughs> in the infrared, it's really tough to make observations um, of Venus's atmosphere. So there have been predictions of um, sulfur molecules that could be involved in a life cycle. And we did originally intend to observe those. Um, but the expert advice from people more experienced in Venusian chemistry with a um, bio signatures involving sulfur would be a small component of the overall very complex and not very well understood um, sulfur chemistry network. Um, so anything we got would be more ambiguous. So the point of doing the phosphine um, was to try and remove a lot of the ambiguity. But yeah, I would love if people tell us um, other biomarkers of anaerobic bacteria, for example. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Christine. Okay. Uh, I'm going to bring in uh, some of the other people's names I've seen for a while. I can see Pamela's back again, but I'll try Andrew first. Andrew Law. Again, if you could say uh, where you're from, that would be great. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Thank you very much for uh, taking my question. Um, I've got so, two parts, really. Um, one, I'd like to ask about the time frame for this whole thing. Um, if I understood correctly, you mentioned that this work started back in 2016. And obviously there will have been a portion of observation and verification first, and then presumably a follow-up or a period where um, you would have been studying the, um, uh, the abiological processes that might have led to this. Um, can you talk roughly about how that time frame looks between 2016 to now? 
and whether the processes overlapped at all. And secondly, are you aware that Peter Beck, the CEO of Rocket Lab, is interested in sending a mission to Venus? Thank you. I won't address the Rocket Lab part, but I can talk about the, um, the time frame part. So I came up with this idea um, because I'm a long-term astrobiologist and a millimeter wave astronomer, which is probably an unusual combination. So this idea sort of sprung on me in um, January 2016, and we did spend quite a lot of time um, getting telescopes to realize we had an idea that wouldn't waste a lot of their time. So we got the um, JCMT observations with enormous help from their staff, who are um, the authors on the, at the end of the list on the paper. We got those in June 2017 when that was all set up. Um, took about 18 months to convince ourselves there was a signal, um, then immediately applied to Alma, who kindly gave us um, some special time in the director's remit. Uh, that was kind of dicey because the Alma configuration was okay, but we had to grab it within about a couple of weeks and they had a short unexpected period of bad weather and that kind of thing. So that was March 2019. And then as you said, um, we have spent substantial time um, doing the calculations, so about a year from that, and refining the paper. Does that answer um, what you were after? I'll continue. So um, I just want to back up for a moment and say, to Jane's credit, astronomers and scientists in general almost never do this. She decided to search for life on Venus. She dug through the literature and found this very obscure gas that would be a unique biosignature. She proposed to the telescope, initially got rejected, persevered, and then succeeded. And I just want to say, I think I recall that the MIT folks, we connected with Jane two years ago. And that's when, in particular, Dr. William Baines and Dr. Anish Petkowski, they ramped up on all those calculations that we're, we're talking to you, that, that William was describing. Yeah, it's really helped to have a very diverse team, just of people who have not met before, but were willing to share expertise. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Now we're coming to the last uh, 10 minutes of the briefing. We need to finish around five to okay. accommodate some other uh, requests. So <laughs> I was thinking we should take uh, Jennifer Millard next, and then I will bring in uh, Pamela if you're as well. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jennifer. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. And, and say where you're from and who your question's for. Yes. Excellent. Uh, so I'm Jennifer Millard. Um, I'm representing the Awesome Astronomy podcast and also Sky Guide, um, which is an app available on the App Store. I just want to say a massive congratulations, um, especially to Jane. Woohoo! This is brilliant. Um, Thank you, Jenny. Yeah, I, 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 I you know I've been losing sleep over this because I've been so excited. I don't know what it must be like for you guys. Um, so I have uh, a couple of questions. One of them is a more kind of sciencey question. The other one's just a bit of fun speculation. Um, my first question is, uh, Jane, in your talk, you mentioned that Venus is a natural radio source. Um, where does that radio radiation come from? And then my second question is, assuming that um, the phosphine is produced by life, um, could it be that this life maybe came from Earth and went to Venus, or maybe at some point in the past, like you know, the life traveled from Venus to Earth, maybe the life could be connected. And I know that's a total speculation question, just a bit of fun. I'll take just the first question then. So um, what we call the, the broadband um, natural radio waves from Venus, they're actually a mixture of um, emission from molecules deeper down in the atmosphere that produce these really wide um, sort of um, features all across that graph. Um, so if you looked very closely at the one I showed you, you could see it's not a flat red line. We were expecting without phosphine, it's actually slightly angled. And that's because it's a blend of these broad sort of <laughs> shallow waves, if I can put it that way, across the spectrum. So the dominant molecules, things like carbon dioxide, um, create the um, radio waves that are the um, kind of featureless background in wavelength against which we see the much narrower absorption lines from the upper atmosphere. Um, I'll pass over to uh, one of the others for your um, just answer, just uh, Sarah. Just to fill in one more thing is, so you know, Venus is heated by the sun. It has a tiny amount of its own internal energy, but the sunlight gets completely reprocessed and it gets spit out at longer wavelengths like the radio. And I'll just let William, but I'll just say, so these sulfuric acid droplets, as William showed you that picture of sugar, what happens to it? It's terrible for all of our own earth life types like our amino acids, proteins, DNA would completely dissolve inside these droplets. So it probably has to be a completely different kind of life that probably didn't come from here if that life is even there. 
unless life had some protective shell of wax or graphite or, or sulfur or something like that. William? Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it's a really good question. And people have speculated um, along these lines with respect to Mars, did uh, life, was life from Earth um, in the early days of the solar system ejected from Earth and colonized Mars, or indeed did life arise on Mars and colonize Earth? And you can make the same sort of arguments for Venus. I think it's a bit harder for those for transfers to happen um, from Earth to Venus, because Venus is close to the sun, so the orbital dynamics don't work quite so well, but I'm, I'm not an expert in that. But yes, it could happen um, in principle. The, the problem, as Sarah has, has said, that the cl these clouds are such a strange environment, so, so different from the terrestrial environment, that it's hard to see how life could evolve and adapt to, um, uh, to go from an, uh, a life that could be happy in, on Earth, which essentially is a water, to life that could survive in sulfuric acid. Uh, but it's a really important question because uh, at, at the moment we only have one example of life we know in the entire universe, and that's the example of life on Earth. And if we could find one example of life that had originated elsewhere, so wasn't originating on Earth and transferred to Venus, then that will be a profound sort of philosophical importance in proving that there could be life elsewhere in the universe that is not dependent on life on Earth. And, and that would just be amazing. I just wanted to add a couple things um, to answer the past questions. About the biosignature gas, I didn't answer that one really that well. We have a long list of biosignature gases. We have methane and nitrous oxide, and we have other gases like ammonia or methyl chloride. We have a long list. But many of those are very hard to see from Earth into the Venus atmosphere because A, they may be tangled together or carbon dioxide may be blocking them. And as Jane said, they're not available at these more favorable microwave wavelengths where the molecules are more spread out and have fewer contaminants. If we could go to Venus, then you can amplify the signal um, by an instrument that bounces light back and forth, back and forth, like millions of times inside a little instrument to amplify the signal. Now about Rocket Lab, <laughs> yeah, they want to go to Venus. We have been talking to them. They're um, amazing to be so flexible. And Rocket Lab's spacecraft would be only be about 15 kilograms, and they would reserve about three kilograms or so for a payload. So we have to work hard to make sure an instrument that would be useful for the search for life will fit into that, that payload, and we're really looking forward to it. I think that's a challenge there. I think um, we're going to go take one more yeah, question. I'll, I'll let I Robert would, go uh, ahead with that. Absolutely. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, we've got time for one more. We've got about two minutes left, so maybe a, a quick question and, and snappy uh, answers, which I know is always impossible to ask in these sessions. Um, so I'm going to try Pamela again. Pamela Gabe, you there? If you can come through, let's let's see if we can hear you this time. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, yes we can. Hi, this is Pamela Gay from the Daily Space at the Planetary Science Institute. I, is this a signature that you'd be capable of detecting on the night side of Venus? And is there any reason to think that there'd be variation between the day side and the night side? Uh, I think that's for Sarah. I was going to let you answer it, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I Not getting... in the millimeter wave signal, but I think um, there's some faults about the infrared signal because the detectability um, it varies on the um, uh, light and dark side. Okay. Um, right, I think I should uh, okay. wind it up there. Unless any of the other panelists want to answer that point, then I think uh, we should wind it up here. Um, I very much appreciate the time the panelists have given, nor my colleagues who are invisible in this uh, this session, like Lucinda Offrews, they're busy managing the whole thing so that we actually made it work. Uh, and my, my other colleagues at the Royal Astronomical Society and in the different associated institutions in Hawaii and the US and, uh, and the, uh, across the UK. So uh, with that, it's been a great pleasure. If you want to find out more about this, we will have things, if you're watching as a member of the public as well, we will have things I can explain a video on our website. Obviously, there's a lot of those on our partners, at, um, particularly at MIT and ESO as well. And so do look for those too. They should be live now. I believe the paper is live and available now as well. Or if it isn't uh, ready now, it should be very soon. So uh, thank you once again. Um, I'll also point you again to our Twitter account at World AstroSoc, where you can see the Twitter chat tomorrow and the Reddit Ask Me Anything on Wednesday. And now I think uh, Jane and the others probably have to go and talk to other members of the media. So um, they, they, it's not over for them yet, nor should it be really. I think it's been a fantastic uh, session. So thank you to everybody. And I guess we'll leave it there. So.
my goodness, that was so interesting, wasn't it? Uh, wow, that's a lot to take in, a lot of information. Uh, we just finished, uh, let me just turn this down. Uh, we've got video still playing. I'm trying to find for you guys the explainer video um, that they were mentioning um, in this um, event that is up right now. So uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna see if I can get that for you guys. I'll definitely put a link in the comment section uh, regarding that. Um, here we go, we've got videos. Uh, so let's see if I can get this up for you guys. This is fascinating. Let's, uh, I mean, could this be evidence of life on uh, a planet beyond Earth? Uh, it could very well be. Uh, this could be, uh, just that, uh, a, a biochemical marker of life. Uh, that's what they're talking about. So here's this explainer video. Let's, uh, let's just take a look. Um, it's on YouTube. I'll share the link with all you guys uh, right after. Check this out. So, I mean, this is pretty impressive. Uh, finding a, a molecule called phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus, that's what telescopes on Earth detected, the, the very typical signature, radio signature of this molecule, phosphine, which on Earth we believe can only be produced really uh, on Earth-sized worlds, rocky terrestrial type worlds through uh, biological means. So does this mean that phosphine floating in the atmosphere of Venus is produced by life? That's what is being asked right now because we can't figure out any chemistry on a small rocky world. This is what astronomers were saying during their press conference. This is what I, I've gathered, which I thought was very interesting, is that they can't figure out a chemistry uh, uh, method of how uh, abi abiotically uh, this could happen uh, in the atmosphere of Venus. It's just not possible. We do find this phosphine molecule apparently on gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, but they have a very different chemistry. They're very high pressure, uh, very different environmental conditions that apparently allow phosphine to be produced in those atmospheres. But we can't figure out a way on a much smaller rocky world like a terrestrial planet like Venus, which is about exactly the same size as Earth, our neighboring world, we don't know how that could be produced um, uh, other than perhaps by biological means. So this is really exciting. It doesn't mean that we have found for sure evidence of life. We haven't found life, but the possible evidence of life. So what do you guys think? Uh, uh, what, what are your comments? Here we go. Christine says, it's fascinating. Thanks for sharing. Uh, definitely, this is something exciting. Uh, uh, do you think this is a uh, life? Um, do, do you find that this is uh, 
something that for you means that we're not alone in the universe, I think this does potentially bring us closer to that. So it's it's an ex exciting find. It's something that I we're all going to be following. I think there's going to be a lot more missions that are going to be directed towards the second planet in the solar system. Definitely uh, a look a second look at Venus. We always thought that Venus uh, would be so hot. I mean, where even, you know, metal melts, like lead melts on Venus. It's uh, sulfurous rain. It's highly toxic in many respects. But in the upper cloud deck of Venus, it may be much more habitable. That's what the thinking has been for decades. But we haven't had ever, ever any evidence uh, to 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 say otherwise uh, that there was maybe that it's just uh, a dead world it may not be Venus may be much more interesting than we ever thought and it's amazing amazing finding that will follow I will put links to the press release below uh, links to the video that I just showed below in the comment section I'd love to hear from you do you feel that this is evidence of life does this kind of change your mindset on what uh, if, if, if in fact we are alone on in this universe in terms of life? I don't think so. I think microbial life is a very possible. We're already looking at it, not just on Mars. We have been looking on some of the moons of the gas giant worlds like Jupiter's moons, Europa, for instance. We think there's an ice covered ocean, uh, Enceladus uh, around uh, one of the small moons of Saturn, we think, also holds an ocean, a salty ocean, perhaps, underneath a thick ice layer. Uh, so there are other locations in the solar system, but Venus, this is quite surprising, something that I don't think most of us have ever thought of uh, in terms of really holding a big possibility of current life, maybe life in the distant past, maybe when uh, the atmosphere wasn't going through runaway greenhouse effect as we're seeing now, it's so hot and uh, uh, high sulfur content in the atmosphere and all of that. It's a very toxic environment potentially, but could it be very different in the upper atmosphere? That's what scientists have been, uh, have been saying. Uh, so this is something interesting. So if you're watching this in archive mode, it is Monday, September 14th. We just finished a wonderful press conference done by researchers at the Royal Astronomical Society in the UK uh, that announced uh, uh, their new paper that has found that explains the finding of a molecule called phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. And uh, the, they're, they're excited because this could be possible hints of life, uh, basically a biosignature, a marker of currently existing, perhaps microbial life drifting in the atmosphere of Venus. Really exciting stuff, lots to talk about. We're definitely gonna talk more about this. And uh, this, is, this has been exciting. So don't forget to follow me uh, on my channel. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Uh, if you're on YouTube, make sure you subscribe. If you're on Facebook, do follow me as well uh, so you don't miss my next video, which by the way, will be coming up in about 50 minutes talking about what's in the night sky this week. And of course, we'll talk about Venus too. You can see it in the sky. So thanks so much for uh, tuning in. Uh, I hope to see you in about 50 minutes time. I'll be looking at your comments. Stay safe and healthy. And I'll see you on the next video. Clear skies.